Hey, Seattle hockey fans, we have another fantastic show for you, Locked on Kraken. You know I love bringing on guests. You know I love talking about all facets, not only of Seattle Kraken hockey, but of hockey overall. So I'm very excited to bring on our guest for today's show. We'll be working with the Firebirds, the AHL affiliate of the Seattle Kraken, and has an extensive background in hockey herself, the one, the only, Zoe Hickel. Zoe, how are you? Hello, hello. Thanks for having me, Erica. It's nice to see you again. Yes, good to see you again as well. Congratulations on your new role but also congratulations on Ohio State and a national championship. How exciting. <laughs> Thank you. I know it's it's been a little bittersweet, just the highs of that. And uh, I mean, with Ohio State, I have nothing but a full heart from my time there and the people especially. So, um, you know, it ended on a very high note and I'm very thankful for that and uh, excited for my new role here with the the Kraken and the Firebirds. Yes, indeed. Well, we're definitely going to talk about Ohio State, the Ohio State, as some will say. (laughs) Um, So we're going to talk about that. But as you mentioned, you have a new role with the Firebirds and the Seattle Kraken, our affiliates, our AHL affiliates, starting next season officially with players. Um, But uh, last time we spoke... I asked you because you are an Alaska native. I asked you what the vibe and what the buzz was around this new team, the Seattle Kraken, because uh, I don't even know if they had been called, been officially named the Kraken yet when we were speaking. But now here we go, and and you're you're in the fold. So tell us how yeah. this got started, and 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 kind of you know what that journey was like, and kind of how you're feeling of, about being able to take this next step in your career. Yeah, I mean, I guess I have been in Ohio since last time we spoke, but there was a lot of buzz about the Kraken and, you know, Alaskans are huge hockey fans. So it's pretty cool to see the the following that that's been. And now for the affiliate to be in Palm Springs. And I'm pretty sure oh, I know that Alaska Airlines is one of the sponsors or partners. So, you know, that nonstop flight from Anchorage to Palm Springs might be a little more interesting to, <laughs> to the Alaskans over the course of those long, dark winters. So hopefully we get some of that extension into Palm Springs as well. So Um, But yeah, tons of energy, a lot of Canadians down here too. So a lot of the snowbirds that live here, um, from what they call themselves or what we like to call them, are super pumped about hockey being in the desert and taking off in some other areas like Vegas. And uh, we're really excited to, to be another part of that too. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, you talked about Canadians, including the amazing Shannon Miller, historic on the women's side of hockey in particular, uh, and women's hockey in Canada. But um, yeah, so this role, we have it there for everyone that can read it. So you're going to be working in hockey programming and community relations. So, you know, um, give us a sense of, of what that will look like, uh, and particularly what that will look like once we start having players um, that are in the Seattle Kraken system migrate from Charlotte to the Firebirds? Yeah, it's, uh, well, it's hard to see, I guess, right now without the rink and everything. But right now we're building out all of those programs and what we're doing to be in the schools. Right now there's been um, about 3,000 kids just in the school districts. I know we've been into 25 different schools and putting in street hockey. And like you said, Shannon has done an amazing job with her being the VP into the community relations. And some of the roles with us will change as the players get here. And as we get the rank going and programming out all the learn to play and adult leagues and, and kids and getting everybody on skates. But right now, a lot of our efforts are towards getting people super excited about hockey. And as we knew growing up playing, playing hockey, like if you don't have ice, you're in your tennis shoes or in your rollerblades in the street, messing with a, a stick and puck, you know, or a stick and ball. So playing with your buddies and, um, you know, it's what we grew up doing. And a lot of reason of why you love the game. So uh, it's it's been pretty cool to see these kids and doing the clinics here and seeing how much they love it. And then they're like tugging on your shirt after like, when do I get to put my skates on? Or when's the next clinic? That was so fun. And, you know, we're at the beginning of the class. They're shy to even handle the ball or shoot, the, you know, because they're around their peers. But it's really, really cool to see. And the after school programs. And now we have, 
I believe, three of the United School Districts within the Coachella Valley that want to put it into their curriculums with school. So very That's exciting very cool. times. Yes. That's amazing. So, I mean, really having a hand in growing the game, it sounds like, in the Coachella Valley, which is super exciting. Now, I come from, you know, I guess what's an original six market. I'm, I'm originally from New York, but uh, we were talking offline. I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma now. And, you know, I, I understand that there used to be a pretty good youth program, youth hockey program here. I'm curious what it's been like for you. I mean, you know, being in Alaska, I think is probably more of a traditional hockey market, at least, you know, by, by um, you know, the, the types of weather that you get, whereas Coachella sure. Valley, very different. Um, yeah. So, you know, what has that been like from your perspective, just to be able to grow this beautiful game of hockey, um, but have to do it in unique ways, not just because of the demographics, but as you already mentioned, that it's everything's very new and a lot of the facilities are still being built up. Yeah, for sure. There'll be a demand for the ice. Absolutely. <laughs> um, which is why it's important for us to, you know, get people educated on the game in other ways and whether it's through their schools or after school programs and just getting them excited about hockey is like a huge way to do it. Um, so that as we build towards that arena and we can get kids, you know, in equipment and on the ice, that they're really excited about doing that. And for the adults too. I, the, there are so many adults that are here that have, you know, either used to play or have played or still want to play and, um, or want to learn about the game because we have this affiliate and this, a team in this team that's now with uh, the crack and everyone is so excited about it. It's really cool to see. And like you said, the demographics are so different, but, um, you know, in Alaska, everyone's got, even all the elementary schools that have a rink that's attached to their, you know, school or every high school would an outdoor rink that you would fill in the winter time. But <laughs> around here, it might be more basketball or tennis courts. Um, but those couple as great courts for street hockey, too. So it's uh, just putting a stick and ball in their hand instead of a basketball or a soccer, you know, a soccer yeah. ball. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Have that versatility. I, I love yeah. it. Um, so, okay, I want to switch gears a little bit here because in the next segment in particular, we're going to talk a lot about you and your playing career, Zoe, that I got to see firsthand covering women's hockey. But um, I, I want to talk a little bit more about this transition. You mentioned it's bittersweet. I mean, this seems like such an amazing opportunity. Again, we were just kind of talking because you're native to Alaska about the excitement around the Seattle Kraken. And now of course the Firebirds, their affiliate, but um, you know, when did it start becoming an opportunity maybe for you to kind of hop on this new wave um, of, of hockey in the Pacific Northwest or on the West coast now in Coachella Valley? Yeah, I think the West coast and the Pacific Northwest have always felt a little bit at home for me. So um you know, when the opportunity came across my desk, it was one that my husband just finished at the Olympics too. And he brought home a, a bronze medal for Canada, but, you know, <laughs> we'll take it for Bob Sled. So he's figuring out some transition time in his career. And uh, it, it was kind of an opportunity for us to, to start a new direction together. And um, yeah, it was very appealing for some of the things that I'm going to be involved with and, um, you know, maybe get some more time in Alaska, too. And with that affiliate with the crack and having them be part of uh, the triangle, really, and part of the network of the crack and, and uh, you know, which I'm sure will get a lot of fans down here in Palm Springs. It, there's too much of a pipeline not to 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 be to want to be part of that. So um, that that's a little thing. But yeah, with Ohio State, it was bittersweet because I was supported so well with so many great people and good friends and, um, you know, saying bye to the team and stuff like that was one of the hardest things I've had to do. And, and with Nadine Maserol, she has been great to me. So yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's bittersweet for sure. But I'm very excited to to be in the area and be working in men's professional sports and um, a lot of growth and opportunity. 
Yeah, well, very excited for you, for sure. So, um, you know, you, you talked about Ohio State and it being bittersweet. I mean, did you know by that that championship game where ultimately you came out on top, Ohio State came out on top, but did you know at that point that you'd be transitioning for sure? Mm-mm. Nope. <laughs> okay, so you got to right enjoy <laughs> oh, right yeah. at, like right after because we got the announcement shortly after. I wasn't sure what the timeline yeah. was for you. So it you happened were, very like, quickly. Oh wow, that's wow. Yeah. So okay, but you you still got to like experience that high like purely yeah. Yeah. knowing that you were gonna be with the team. Um, but then also, as you mentioned a few times already, that bittersweet. It's like, oh my gosh, we just did this and it's amazing, mm-hmm. and now it's like, oh, but I'm gone. Yeah. Oh, wow. But you know, sports, stuff happens fast. <laughs> it's so fast. I'm just grateful I got to experience that and, yeah. and not a really good note and oh, um, you yeah. know, cultivate those relationships and keep them. So, yeah. Well, last thing on this before we transition again to your playing career, and you mentioned China and your husband. So, I definitely want to talk about Beijing. But um, um, I want to ask a little bit about being at Ohio State. Now, that program, and you mentioned Nadine and the amazing work that she's done. But I'm sure, as someone that has worked on her staff, you have heard stories and maybe even seen some of the remnants of what it takes to start a program in a place that is not necessarily focused on hockey. I mean, Ohio State, you know, everyone's going to that football stadium, you know, or or maybe even basketball. But, you know, it's taken a while to build up that program. And then you see it top off with a national championship. I mean, are there any things from just being able to see Nadine and, and at work uh, that you think you can now bring to, again, bringing hockey to a market that seems open to it, but doesn't have that history of hockey? Yeah, yeah that's a good point. There's There's parallels there with Ohio not being a traditional hockey market. And you could say the same thing for around here. So I think it's just the exposure piece and making sure that we're tapping into the right resources and, um, you know, the right people and the community around here is amazing. And I think, you know, something Muz always mentioned, Nadine Muzzerell, about Color Muzz, um, about Ohio State is a, it's a bit of a sleeping giant, you know, that you have this huge institution that has a history of excellence in sport and, you know, with the football team being as high profile as they are, there's so many resources with that institution and what you, the possibilities it can, that you can do with it. And uh, yeah, it took a lot of elbow grease, hard work and long days and nights. And um, I was part of some of that and I feel grateful to be part of that journey. So um, it, but it, it does take a lot of work and there's no doubt that she she'll do anything it takes to, you know, to make sure that she's getting to the top and, she's done an amazing job building that program. So for sure, it's inspiring to, to come from a place like that where you're like, Hey, this is possible. The resources are in the right place. And this is something that we can do. That's definitely a different demographic, but people still love sports. It seems like people still love hockey in this area. And they're super excited about having the Akersher arena, which will also bring in entertainment and, you know, 11,000 people into one building in Palm desert, which will be in the middle of the Coachella Valley. So it'll be able to reach this entire valley and it'll be a huge center point for so many different opportunities, including events and, um, you know, big concerts and, and also a hockey team. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, I am known to travel for hockey. So I personally, you know, very selfishly cannot wait uh, for yeah. everything to get up and running. And then, you know, now there's a connection. I can, you know, cover right. the Seattle crack in there. But uh, Zoe, Ooh. coming up next, we want to talk to you again a little bit more about your playing career. And uh, then we'll have some fun. Uh, give you some really hard hitting questions at the end of the show so uh, fans can get to know you a little bit better. But we're going to take a little break and uh, we'll come right back. As always, I want to thank you for making Locked on Crack and your first listen of the day. Now we got to take care of a little bit of business, and that's with uh, Built Bar. You know, I love Built Bar. I'm working on my calorie intake, getting the right nutrition in, and 17 grams of protein, only four net grams of only four net carbs, excuse me, only four grams of sugar, about 130 calories. I like it. I like it. I've got my athletic greens to start my day and to nibble on through some of those work meetings, I grab a built bar. 
I love the double chocolate. Anything churro flavor because they have a protein infused puff. It's a marshmallow poof with protein in it. What don't you like? Covered in chocolate. Delicious. Even deliciouser when you get to some of their special flavors. Coconut marshmallow, banana cream pie. Those are all the puffs flavors. Then, of course, you've got your mint brownie, coconut almond, cherry barcia, white chocolate cookies and cream and on and on and on. So stay up to date and to make sure that you're not hangry throughout the day, head over to built.com and you can use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off your next order. That's LOCKED15 for 15% off your next order at Built Bar. Happy snacking. And just like every day, we want to remind you to listen to Locked On Now. You can listen to it. You can watch it. It's free and available wherever you can find the Locked On Podcast Network. The Locked On NHL hosts, after big news, breaking news, trade deadlines, and post-game reactions, we get all of that together from across all 32 teams, or whoever was playing that night, I should say, and then we create the Locked On Now show for you so you're not missing any of the action. Of course, you're going to listen to Locked On Kraken, but if you want to know what the other teams are doing, listen to Locked On Now, free wherever you listen or watch podcasts. All right, Zoe, we are back for the second stanza, as I like to say. Uh, we get to You get to stick around with us here at Locked On Kraken, but uh, we're talking to Zoe Hickel, the manager of hockey programming and community relations for the Coachella Valley Firebirds, our AHL affiliate that will get things cracking, as we like to say, officially with players in market next season. All right, Zoe, so we talked about Ohio State and that championship and – we talked about, uh, you know, Nadine Muzzerall, just such a force. I loved, you know, that you talked about that earlier. Um, you know, but there's another pretty big force, especially for those of us who know women's hockey history. And you're reunited with Shannon Miller again here. Um, and it, it sounds like are, are really responsible for, again, doing a lot of the work that you mentioned earlier as far as building out those community relations. But, um, you know, Minnesota Duluth. <laughs> I talked to Shannon Miller. Miller because Minnesota Duluth was in the first ever women's NCAA championship game when it was officially uh, NCAA. So um, what can you tell me about, uh, you know, the history that you know of Minnesota Duluth and, you know, what attracted you to, to go there as a player? Yeah, I mean, Shannon Miller has been an icon in for many generations uh, and been an inspiration to many uh, being at Duluth for, I believe it was 16 years and winning five national championships as the head coach. And um, I know that when I was going through my process and what I actually went to Duluth when I was in eighth grade, it was eighth going into ninth. It was that summer. And I was in the area for a national camp, one of the U S development camps. I, I, I went and we took the opportunity being from Alaska to go to, to, to Duluth and uh, it was beautiful. Like instantly I fell in love with the, the area. It was in the summertime. So of course it was beautiful on the lake and I, I got to meet Shannon and she's like, come on in. Let me, we still have a picture of the two of us holding one of her NCAA trophies together. And I'm just a little punk with like two braids in <laughs> a tank top because I was it was so hot there in the summertime for me (laughs) and uh yeah we got to share that moment and then ever since then like I was interested in some other schools and you know the process kept happening and Duluth was still my number one I did developed a great relationship with her from the beginning and um yeah and that's and that's how I decided to end up going there but and then through our time there, I, you know, ended up being one of her leaders and captains and um, really built that relationship through some of our ups and downs. But I'm so, so thankful for her in my life. And she's always been a huge mentor of mine. And I feel grateful that our paths get to cross again and that we get to work together in a completely different environment. But it's so, so cool. We've gone off and done our own thing. And then now we get to reconnect. So uh, it's very, very special. 
Wow, that's amazing. Um, I mean, I just love so many people talk about the hockey community being so small. And I think that's very true. I think, though, when you even narrow it down to women's hockey or then college hockey, I mean, you just always are crossing paths um, over and over again, um, which I think is cool. Uh, Hopefully, most of the time it's cool. I mean, unless there's beef, then maybe not. But <laughs> no, but we all grow out of that eventually. But um, OK, so so Minnesota Duluth and then you were able to play with the national team and go on to play professionally in a few different places. Um, so I want to uh, flash forward, though, to your time playing in China, um, because uh, I was just at the Beijing Olympics. I didn't make it up to the the mountains, so okay. I wouldn't have seen your husband compete. But um, I I was more so focused on on hockey, um, and got to see the women's and men's tournaments up lot uh, up up close and personal live. Um, Canada also also won there, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, but but what I loved in being able to watch the women's tournament there in particular is knowing how many people from a lot of different federations were a part of the growth of that national team, the host team in China. And you were one of the players that was able to, to compete in China and, and kind of see that growth and development from a team that had been in the Olympics many years ago, but really reestablishing themselves as a national team. What can you tell us about your time in China and really growing women's ice hockey there? Um, yeah, that's a loaded question for sure, because my time in China, although it was a year contract, it felt like it was many years. <laughs> it was so, but in the best way possible. I had I had such a blast and was fortunate to be part of that first team um, with the KRS. And that was when it was split into Vancouver Rays and, K- and Kunlun Red Star. Um, you know, I had one of my really good friends, Kelly Stack with me too, along with like some others that had come from the national team and, um, having those friends along with just the, the area that we were in and the, the Chinese nationals that we were paired with and what we got to do with them was so, it was, it was so unique and something I've never experienced before or have since, but, um, to see some of those same players that, got to play at the Olympics. And I know there were some others that were traditionally from, you know, born Canadian, but they've had some heritage in them that uh, they were able to play. So it's, it was so unique to see that process happen. And, you know, no one knew really what was going to happen probably until up until the Olympics when it came to some of that stuff or like who was able to play, but to be part of that first year of the program was really, really cool. And, um, you know, I still stay in touch with some of the players today and to see them on TV playing, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Like they did it. You know, you never know how that process goes over the cor- course of four years, even with, you know, my time with the national team, like every year there's so much that can change and it's really a grind to keep with it and to make sure that, you know, you're bettering yourself every day to make that final roster. Yeah. And I mean, you know, that grind, as you say, I mean, arguably very different for the teams in North America, the United States, Canada, that really jockey and and vie for that number one, number two spot, whether it's world championships or uh, things like four nations, which we haven't seen in a while, but, um, you know, or the Olympics, of course, but then there's a whole different, and I don't know that too many people really take the time to look at all of the other levels of hockey, whether you're looking at um, women's or men's, where you're having teams that are then jockeying to get the honor, right, of playing the North American teams. And, you know, China just recently got bumped into that top division. So, you know, when you look at that time, as you said, which was like one year, but like many at the same time, um, you know, what, what about um, that process and the investment um, do you think led to the team in, you know, just a handful of years, maybe like a cycle and a half, we'll say, you know, an Olympic cycle and a half um, to make that jump. And how do you think that will bode for other teams really wanting to improve their standing on the women's ice hockey side of things? 
Yeah, that's it's a good point. I think that hosting the Olympics was a big motivator for them. And they, again, had the funding and some of the resources they really poured into creating their their ranks and their teams and bringing in players from the U.S. and Canada to help develop their, you know, their national team players. And we even worked in some grassroots, which was pretty cool to see these little kids and getting them on the ice. <laughs> it was it was so fun. Um and, you know, then you're trying to communicate with them, too, and understand their language and their culture, but also try to take what we know, you know, they're trying to learn from the best in the in the world and bring that to what and to what they have. But you also have to respect their culture and what they're doing. So that was one of the biggest challenges was the communication piece, um, you know, stuff like nutrition and the training and stuff that we wanted to teach them in order for them to be the very best that they could be, because it is a long process and you have to continue to, to stay there. But I think the league's changing too. Originally we were, in, we were in the CWHL in the Canadian league. And then when that folded, they joined that Russian league, which I, I believe made it better. I don't know too much about that league, but um, I think it ex gave a lot more exposure to some of what's going on here. Uh, which is great to see that the game is growing. You know, you have your SDHL in Sweden and then you have that Russian league. And then we have a couple leagues still in North America and trying to figure it all out. But um, I know that a, more, a lot of the social media and stuff I was following with the Chinese exposed a lot of what was going on with that Russian league. So it all helps. I think we're getting, we're working on getting our way up to make, one great thing but it's it's cool to see that that exists in all parts of the world and um hopefully that just continues to elevate the entire world and you know that competition overall yeah i love that you mentioned that because uh, again us being in north america we're very much focused on the north american teams and the landscape of women's professional hockey here which mm -hmm. um you know uh, it, it it goes up and down ebbs and flows just like everything else but i i think the perspective is really what i hear you saying um and having that perspective um, from a different vantage point I, I think you're right. Um, putting it all into context is going to be critically important as the women's game continues to grow. I mean, because it's going to grow regardless. We've seen that, whether yeah. we're talking about Ohio State or even what you're able to do now with the Firebirds. So I'm excited. Maybe it's I, I, I put my optimism hat on today, but <laughs> you have to. Exactly. You have to. There's too much to complain about. <laughs> it's very true. It's very true. All right. Well, Zoe, we're going to keep you just for a few more minutes. But coming up next, we're going to do a quick rapid fire. Uh, most important and pressing questions with Zoe Hickel. <laughs> BetOnline.net is your number one source for betting stats and sports info. Find all the latest sports development league reviews, news, and including this year's basketball playoffs, not to mention the start of Major League Baseball season. And of course, they meant to also add, we're getting to the postseason for the National Hockey League. So check that out too, because Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Zoe, thank you so much for joining us here on Locked on Kraken. We hope this is the first of many, many visits uh, on the podcast, and hopefully I'll get my way out to the Coachella Valley. I know that area is uh, going to be popping pretty soon, uh, <laughs> music-wise. Right. Oh, yeah, this weekend, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah Co Coachella. It's going to yeah. be a big deal. Um, but we'll see what happens come hockey season. Okay, so like I said, most pressing questions. So – Speaking of music, uh, you're from Alaska. How do Alaskans feel about Maggie Rogers and her song, Alaska? I think it's popular. I like it. It's a good song. I don't have a song. great opinion about it, but I like it. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, because sometimes people write songs about places that they're not from, and you're like, mm -hmm. mm, I don't know. I don't know about yeah. that. <laughs> okay. So, okay. It's We're good. Yeah, it's a good tune. It's catchy. I mean, Pharrell likes it, so. Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Well, if Pharrell likes it, then I Yeah, like yeah. Okay, so the story goes, um, she was in, at, like, at NYU, and um, they, she had this, um, I don't know, like a cohort or something, and they would have 
artists just pop in randomly and like just kind of give them feedback. And so Alaska is the song that ended up playing and then it went viral and that's oh. kind of how she got started. Yeah. Very cool. There you go. Going, huh? Yeah. yeah. It's a song you definitely would put on around the campfire. Yeah. Fun. It's just going to bounce around, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, love I love it. Okay. Okay. Hard hitting questions here. Now, um, a lot of people may know this, but you brought home a rescue from China. Um, yeah. Oh. Uh, and so um, I wanted to know, though, other than other than your your pup, uh, what are some other things that you brought back from you, whether it's just like practices or, you know, things that that changed uh, from after coming back from China for you from China? Yeah. Well, perspective is one. <laughs> Travel will give that to you. Yeah. Uh, and good friends, like really good friends that I feel that I could reach out at any time. I don't I don't get to see them often, but um, people that I would stay in touch with and um, a piece of that culture that will st stay with me forever. And I love dumplings. I never thought I would love dumplings so much, but until I went there, they, that's the real deal. And bubble tea, which is Ooh, Night yeah, Child yeah. is the name of my dog. And that is Neo Nycha is like milk tea. Mm. It looks like a little milk tea. And so <laughs> I took some of my, one of my favorite foods and I just named it my dog. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I love that. I absolutely love that. Okay. We'll, um, we'll keep going with this one now. This, this, is not, this is a tough one. This is a tough one here. Okay. Um, who are you picking uh, – in a pickup game, let's say, let's just go with ball hockey. Are you going Shannon Miller or Nadine Muzzerall? Oh boy. Uh, I got like, can I take them both? Cause <laughs> they're both fighters and I would want them both. I would want on one on each wingman. <laughs> I get to be the center between both of them. <laughs> then, then you, I feel like you would just have open space. Like, because the business is being handled elsewhere. Yeah, it's being handled. <laughs> I know Muzz can snipe. She's our ringer. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. All right. I will give you that. Very good answer. Very good answer. All right. Final one. And this one is forward thinking. What should Seattle Kraken fans be most excited about when it comes to finally getting to see the Coachella Valley Firebirds in full swing? Well, they should be excited for the fact that they can come down and watch really good hockey and also play a round of golf or two in the same day. Ooh, there you go. Sold and sold. Well, uh, you mentioned Alaska Airlines. I know they were doing a special where if you wear your Kraken jersey on your flight – uh, that you'd get some kind of deal on your next fight. So I don't know. Uh, I think you got upgraded too. So hopefully they'll do that for the Firebirds because those jerseys are pretty, pretty sweet. Not going to lie. Yeah. <laughs> I got to cop me one of those. Yeah. <laughs> that would be wicked. That would be so super dope. And then yeah. all the families always come in. You, you sold it with the two rounds of golf. So now you're going to have yeah. a lot of folks come in to visit. <laughs> Easy. Easy sell. <laughs> Come spend all your money. <laughs> all of the money. Spend all of the money. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, Zoe, again, thank you so much for your time. It's such a delight. I was saying after the OSU win that you and Nadine, in the past, you know, few pandemic years, your my interviews with you both really stood out like top five, just amazing, thoughtful conversations. So I'm so glad I have an opportunity to chat with you again. And like I said, Open invitation anytime you want to come on Locked on Kraken. <laughs> oh, thank you, Erica. I appreciate it. And thanks again for all your support, too. Love what you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Zoe Hickel with the Coachella Valley Firebirds. Thank you for being on this episode of Locked on Kraken. We look forward to the activations that you have coming up and to see the team on the ice. Fire and ice, baby. Let's go. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> And now that you've listened to Locked on Kraken, we've told you, hold fast, stay true, let's go Kraken. Now it's time for you to listen to Locked on Fantasy Hockey. My fantasy hockey team is absolutely kaput, but that's because I didn't have the Locked on Fantasy show and I wasn't locked on to fantasy hockey. But hosts Steel Roden and Flip Livingstone will help you become the expert of your fantasy league. And just like everything else on the Locked on Podcast Network, this 
podcast and all its episodes are free and available wherever you listen or watch podcasts. And um hang on. I'm so, can't. <laughs> Sorry, my husband just walked in the door. <laughs> <That's so good. laughs> um anyway, I <laughs>